Welcome, everybody. This is Extended Legal Information on the Web, Looking Beyond Traditional Research Skills. I'm Bob Weiner. I'm the Electronic Services Librarian at the Syracuse University College of Law. I'd just like to take a moment to introduce my co-presenters today. Linda Roberge is the Senior Research Fellow at the Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse at Syracuse University, and Patricia Hassett is Professor of Law at the Syracuse University College of Law. What we're going to be talking about today is new types of information, what we're calling extended information. We're going to be talking about how this information relates to legal research, and then also talking about new skills that we may need to teach our students in order to make use of extended information. We're using the term extended information to describe integrated compilations of data, much of it statistical in nature, stored in databases and data warehouses. Utilizing data mining tools, the data can be accessed via the web, allowing users to uncover trends, relationships, and patterns through data analysis. By way of an introduction, I'll be briefly mentioning some trends um, impacting the availability of statistical data on the web, as well as looking at some trends impacting the academic law environment. I'll be sharing some examples of extended information resources. And then I'll be turning the program over to Linda and Patricia, and they'll be further talking about the role extended legal information resources can play in current and future legal research. I want to first start out by just talking about some of these trends that I'm calling big world trends. Um, looking outside of my small uh, little uh, place in Syracuse, but looking at the big world. Um, certainly increased data uh, storage capabilities have made it easier to present statistical data sets on the web. Uh, many government agencies and other organizations are putting operational data and other special collections on the web. Data mining tools and point-and-click technologies are allowing for easier access, manipulation, and presentation of data sets. It's also a movement towards um, more inter interdisciplinary collaboration in the academic law environment. I'll be speaking more about that uh, shortly. And certainly, Freedom of Information Act requests have opened access to new information sources previously unavailable to the public. Uh, now bringing things closer to home, uh, trends that I'm seeing in my backyard at uh, the Syracuse University College of Law. Uh, we're seeing uh, much more interdisciplinary initiatives. We have more joint degree programs. At the university, we have our university-wide initiative, SPIRE, the Strategic Partnership for Innovative Research and Education. And that's really promoting partnerships between the various schools and colleges on campus, including uh, the College of Law. Um, it's just been announced that um, I believe Syracuse is going to be offering the only graduate degree program in disability studies, and it's going to be a joint venture between the College of Law and the School of Education. We also have seen a lot of new research centers at the College of Law. Within the last year or two, we've had the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism open, as well as the Center for Indigenous Law, Governance, and Citizenship. We're also seeing um, availability of data resources available on campus, site licenses to statistical software packages. So if you're interested in working with the raw data, um, you have access to those software packages. The university also has institutional membership in ICPSR, the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, provides access to a lot of data sets. And the university is also home to track which is something you're going to be hearing more about today. If you're not aware of TRAC, it's a phenomenal resource. Uh, Linda's going to be talking a little bit more about that. Um, you may have read about some of the uh, TRAC research in some of the New York Times articles, but a uh, very, very rich resource. We'll be looking at that a little bit later. So where are these trends um, leading me as far as my work? Well, certainly um, statistical data is becoming easier to use on the web. You don't need to be a statistician to use them, so you don't need those um, sophisticated software packages. Um, more and more of this data and associated services along with the data are going to become available, and the key to that is the interactivity with the data. Also, in our library, we're looking at information resources um, in a much more broad subject area. We're certainly looking at um, what might be considered non-traditional legal resources and considering how they might be applied to legal research and the law school curriculum. 
I want to just take a minute to just um, go to some free government sites to show you what the government's doing with some of these data resources, just to demonstrate some of the point-and-click technologies that are available there, give you a basic idea of what's out there. Certainly this isn't the sophisticated stuff, but I just thought um, it would be a starting point. Here's the FedStat site. I don't know if, if you've used that site before, but this is one of the main gateways to, to, to statistics from over 100 U.S. federal agencies. The thing I liked about this site is the um, link here at the bottom to data access tools. And if you click there, it will take you to a page that lists the various government agencies and the data access tools that they have available for you to access the statistical information. Just for a minute, we'll go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics site. If we, if we click on this selective access, it will take us there. And here are all the data sets that are available for us to work with. I'm going to scroll down to compensation and working conditions. And if we look at this occupational injuries and illnesses uh, industry data 1989 through current, we have several icons we can choose from to create customized tables. We can do that in one screen interface, or we can do it over here in multiple screens. I'm going to click on the single screen access. Oh, well, I guess I should have gone there first. Hmm. What happens when you try to do live demos here? Um, well... Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, how about if we go to the National Juvenile Court Data Archives, see if we can do something there. Um, this is um, a site that's put together and was established by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention within the U.S. Department of Justice. This site is one you can go to if you actually want to download um, data sets and order them. You can get permissions in order to do that. Um, I'm going to click on this products and publications because they do have an easy access um, site. If you click on this easy access to juvenile court statistics, they have what they call this analyze delinquency cases tab. If we click there, it gives us um, an interface where we can choose various variables in order to display the data that, we're lo that we want to look at. So, for instance, if we choose age at referral, row variable, and if we choose, oh, let's choose detention, whether they were detained or not detained, and we can choose the years of information that we want to look at. Just choose a 10-year period. We can just click those, and let's say we want to look at female statistics. We can then click this show table, and here's the data presented to us in a table. Um, down the side you can see age, and then you can see detained or not detained. There's also icons if you want to download that data. Um, you can do that. You can also change the uh, column information into percentages, if you want to do that. Um, and you'll have that information available to you to use. You didn't have to work with the raw data. You didn't have to find it. You didn't have to order it. Um, but it's there for you through a point-and-click interface. It's just some very um, basic functionality. Um, and obviously, if the government's doing it, um, the paid services that are out there are um, certainly much more sophisticated. Going back to PowerPoint, even with my comments about increased interdisciplinary collaboration, still could be said, well, why should I care? This is really social science data. Um, how does this really relate to legal research? And with that, I'll turn it over to Patricia Hassett. Uh, the point that we're going to try to make here is that we're all familiar with our schools, 
uh, activities in preparing our students to deal with statutory research and case research, and no law school would even dream of questioning the need of getting the students to be familiar with the uh, standard techniques for making this research and acquiring it, analyzing it, using it. What we haven't done, uh, for a variety of reasons, is to worry so much about uh, what we're calling here contextual research, it, research that, that tells you more about how the legal, op the legal system works or how cases operate or the, the number side of legal research. Not because these numbers haven't been, um, haven't been relevant before. Uh, we, we are relevant uh, to provide insight into the legal system or environment in which we're working. For example, a, a, a lawyer, and by extension working backwards, a law student may, may find it very helpful in analyzing a, a sentencing case, which are much in the news these days. So whether uh, the judge that your client is dealing with is, um, is sentencing high or low or in accordance with guidelines or is departing from them and with what frequency you might be interested in what the uh, U.S. I'm talking about federal cases, what the U.S. attorney that's assigned your case has done in the past. And understanding how they've operated in the past in similar cases could be very helpful in developing a strategy of how you advise your client and what you suggest your client might do. Um, so, so that would be uh, one kind of contextual information. Even uh, we'll get in a minute to some, some cases where that kind of statistical information has been used in substantive issues, trying to decide the merits of a particular case. I'll get to that in a minute. But just thinking about both meritorious or substantive uses and contextual background uses or how the system works uses raises the question of whether we should be teaching our students how to use this information. In the past, this kind of information has been available on a kind of uh, anecdotal basis. Lawyers who work in the system say, well, I know how this judge operates, I know how this U.S. attorney operates, this prosecutor operates, I know how this lawyer operates, I know how many cases there are roughly, and I know how they work. But if you haven't had an experience, then you haven't had access to this anecdotal or experiential information. And then a wider range of cases where we're actually using the information substantively, uh, you probably have thought about, well, you'd need a social scientist to, to, to go out and gather the information because it hasn't been available. So, so we haven't been teaching since this information has been kind of inaccessible or non-available, we haven't really been teaching our students to recognize its existence and to uh, understand how to use it. So uh, we're thinking, our proposal is, or our suggestion is, that the increasing availability of various kinds of systemic, operational, and other data in usable forms should cause the law schools now to be thinking about adding to their uh, educational agenda uh, skills that would enable the law students to recognize the need for this, this sort of what we call extended information, which has really many subcategories, uh, learning how to find it, where, where can they look for it and what, how, how can they access it, and what critical thinking skills are associated with using it. And we gave two examples. Uh, some of this information comes in the forms of charts and graphs, and so students should have some basic familiarity with uh, knowing how to read charts and graphs. And uh, then there's the sort of larger category that we've labeled uh, numerical literacy, uh, how to deal with averages, medians, various other kinds of statistical information and categories and, and labels that that haven't played a big role in um, legal education simply because the, ev ed the information hasn't been available. So the next thing we're going to do today is we're going to use TRAC, which was mentioned by Bob earlier, the tr uh, Syracuse University's Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, which is a source of this kind of data. We're going to use it to show you how it might be used and my colleague, Linda Roberge, who is knee-deep in this project, will give you some examples that will bring this 
<laughs> yeah, no, Steve, and that will bring home uh, how this might be used. Hi, you get three of us for the price of one price today. Of one. So, okay. Um, before I delve into the examples, I want to talk a little bit about what TRAC is. Um, Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, and I have been told that a marketer did not create that name. Um, nobody knows what a transactional record is. <laughs> oh, what am I doing? I also want to use the lapel mic. Oh, I decided I didn't want to use okay. it. Okay, that's fine. That's Can fine. anybody not hear me? Uh, what about the webcast? Yeah. Do you want to be preserved for people who aren't here? Yeah. Oh. It's my life um, in, in <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> I'm gonna turn that down just a little bit. There we go. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. My uh, I usually teach in one of these big auditoriums, and my students never have a chance to uh, to get away from my voice. It carries. Okay. So we have been around for a long time. We're, whoops. Just keep adjusting, just keep going. Okay, um, track has been around for a long time doing essentially the same things, uh, basically since 1989. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary research center, and while what we do hasn't changed, um, how we do it has changed. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> um, we're still supported primarily by grants. But the web has enabled us to um, sell subscriptions to our data warehouse. So that's been a big change for us. Um, basically what we do is we use freedom of information to gain access. Oh, you took my notes. <laughs> we thought that we were so organized. That part isn't preserved, right? <laughs> They were right underneath here. I've accused the wrong innocent, person. Innocent. <laughs> okay. Um, we use freedom of information to gather federal data. Sometimes that's a matter of just simply uh, submitting a request. Um, unfortunately, more often than not, uh, it involves a big struggle. Um, our most recent struggle is with the IRS. Uh, we have standing injunctions against the IRS to provide us data, uh, and they've said, uh, no, you don't. We can't find them. These are, like, you know, very old things. Uh, well, we have found them, and so it just goes on and on and on. Um, once we get the data, we process it. One little word that uh, describes what, you know, generally five uh, computer science graduate students do. Lots of statistical analysis involved in validating the data, um, pulling in other sources of information to merge into the data that we get, um, geography, for example, population. We decode the data. It usually comes in codes. Sometimes the agencies will provide us with code tables. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes new codes will pop up unexpectedly, and so we have to sort of figure out what those are. Okay, um, the web has enabled us to offer um, this data that we didn't used to be able to get out there. Well, now we run a public website, and I'll show you the home page of that for a minute. We're not going to go to any of these live unless anybody's interested at the end. Um, this is available just, you know, to anybody who wants it. We focus on enforcement activities of the various agencies. So FBI will be one of them, for example, new Department of Homeland Security. We use our data warehouse and analyze the data uh, that we have collected and put periodic reports up on that public website for anybody to get into. What we've also started doing is running a subscription website, which is this um, track fed. And that's where we're pulling our examples from today. The technology behind this is um, it's not any rocket science. It's there. It's existing. Um, we use the statistical analysis system, SAS, as the back end that processes all these queries live. And, um, you know, it's there. 
up until now, it's been statisticians that have needed to use it. But I'm sure that the federal government is doing um, much the same thing on the site that you showed, Bob. So, um, okay, this is the home page. Um, you can see if you clicked on that icon, you'd get to, um, you know, the reports that we've done on the FBI and some statistics there. Um, anybody notice anything that they don't think should be up there? Had some massive reorganizations, some hints, customs. That's no longer in existence now. That's moved into DHS and INS has moved into DHS. We still have the icons up there because even though the personnel have moved around, their data systems are still, you know, I, you know, the data that we get is, you know, is customs. That's still how their enforcement uh, recording is taking place. Um, a number of people, though, have said, oh, you're so out of date, you didn't even know this. So I think that we're going to take them down regardless and uh, just put some sort of a disclaimer within DHS. And then if you clicked on trackpad, yep. Yeah? Thank you. Yes, Patricia keeps telling me that I need to remind people that we're independent, we are nonpartisan, um, we have public interest groups uh, from the extreme right and from the extreme left that use our data, but it's data. You know, we don't um, sometimes agree with, um, there must be some politically correct way to say this, but um, I'll just leave it at that. We're, we're nonpartisan. Okay? Okay. So, if you click on Track Fed here, you would get to our subscription website, and I'll talk a little bit more about what's in, available in all of these areas. Okay, so. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the data warehouse. Um, the criminal data that we have is um, all of the federal um, enforcement that takes place gets prosecuted th or not prosecuted through Justice Department. Okay? So the main core that makes up that area is the database, uh, the system of records that Justice uses to track their own workload. Um, there are lots of Department of Justice statistics. They don't put up this stuff. There isn't anything about the cases that they choose not to prosecute. But in fact, we do have uh, a court order that says that they need to provide this to us because it should be public information. Um, for the civil matters, we have, again, everything that goes through justice. But we don't have things that agencies have the ability to bring on their own. So, for example, SEC can bring civil charges on their own. They do not need to go through justice, so we don't have that information. We would like it, and we're trying to decide how many lawsuits we can really support. Um, but at any rate, because um, nobody wants to just give it to us. You know, it may be public, but at any rate, for IRS, we have... Um, a bunch of things on audits and collections and offers and compromise and again things that the IRS chooses not to, to put up there. And uh, we'll have to see how that goes. We've been getting it steadily for years and suddenly this year um, we've not been getting um, the types of things that we usually get. Many of our things come on a monthly basis so it tends to be very current. Um, in the criminal area for example, um, we're usually one month uh, behind the actual date. Uh, we're a little slower right at the moment because they're going through a big uh, change in their data systems. But right now, I think uh, we have the first quarter of uh, fiscal year 2004, so it's not too bad at this point. Uh, in the people and staffing area, we have all of the uh, individual records for all of the employees of the federal government, um, including names, uh, salaries, and I know, I know. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly what my students say. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> well, and so my question to my students is always, should this be up there? I mean, there's no telephone numbers, there's no social security numbers. 
But in fact, um, you know, if somebody hires their brother, uh, maybe, you know, in a democracy, this is information that we should know. We also have um, a lot of information about judges and prosecutors um, and, you know, the cases that they hear, and we'll um, show you one example that relates to that. And then uh, federal funding, so you can, um, for example, if I wanted to know what federal funds come into my county and where they come from, you know, I could get that. And uh, community context stuff is um, a lot, a lot of it comes from um, the Census Bureau. Uh, and then that's stuff that we merge back in, but you can get into it separately too. Um, most of the stuff, certainly the criminal, the civil, um, IRS, um, a lot of the people in staffing things are not available elsewhere. Uh, they're just our data sources, um, you know, we've fought long and hard for, and they're not giving them to anybody else uh, yet, although I would imagine it's going to come. And federal funds you can probably get elsewhere, but they'll be harder to get at, and uh, the census stuff you can get elsewhere. Okay, coupled with this, we've created data mining tools, uh, which sounds pretty scary to people who aren't used to, who aren't statisticians, right? Well, one tool is called the Express tool, and it just gives an easy way to create um, tables, um, also called cross tabs, um, graphs, uh, maps, that type of thing. And you saw one of those uh, with the site that Bob went to. You know, just point and click and produce a table. We also have another data mining tool, uh, which we call Going Deeper. One of the things that statisticians frequently do is drill down into data warehouse data. Um, so it's a drill down capability, but again, it's point and click so that it's very easy to produce uh, information. And then we have an analyzer tool for um, it, more sophisticated analyses. Now, all of these things have been designed for non-statisticians. None of our users are statisticians, and um, so we needed to create something that was easy to use. But they're really robust. Um, you know, even though I've got a very strong background in statistics, I rarely uh, go through the whole thing. I use our own tools because they really are robust. So. Who subscribes? Who would want to pay money for this? Um, for years, our biggest users have been investigative reporters. Uh, I said that we were an interdisciplinary research center, and one of the groups um, that supports us is Newhouse at Syracuse University. They're, that's the journalism school. And journalists have been into computer-assisted investigative reporting for, oh, close to 10 years now, I think. So they, um, they're they really into it in a big way. Um, public interest groups more and more are realizing that they can get their message out if they have something to back it up. Um, very interesting, we have lately begun to get um, subscribers from government offices. Um, nobody really wants that known, so, and, and we don't give, you know, any clues as to where who our users are, uh, but in fact, there's many offices within the Justice Department that use us to look at their own data. Um, they fight us tooth and nail about it, but they use us, so interesting. Uh, university libraries have discovered us recently, and our most recent group of people using us are lawyers. So, All of these groups tend to be word people. Okay, um, I'm not a word person, for example, and I can't spell. Um, but I'm a numbers person. With our reporters, we find they're not numbers people. You know, they really are word people, and I think that the same thing is true for lawyers. So what we have been asking is, what difference does this make as far as using this data? What else is it that we need to teach? So I want to give a couple of examples today which sort of highlight some of the ways that um, lawyers have not been able to use data. Um, first of all, we want to touch on using numbers that fit the need, um, asking the right questions and all of the questions. Okay, you've heard, um, who was it that said there's there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. Well, 
you know, that's part of asking all of the right questions. So, in fact, you get a full picture and not just part of one. And then making large numbers work for you. Now, there are a million other things that we could add to this, but um, we're not going to. So, we're calling this numerical literacy because it's not fancy statistics. There's no regression analysis and there's no hypothesis testing or anything like that. But it's just sort of things that uh, are common sense to some people and not common sense to other people. Okay, so um, our first uh, case comes from uh, an actual phone call that I had gotten. Um, a lawyer uh, was, uh, had a client who wanted to bring a um, discrimination suit against the federal government. So the lawyer was looking at what, it would, be ne what would be necessary to bring this type of a suit. Um, he felt like he needed to hire an investigator and uh, just put in countless hours. So, you know, what were the chances of winning? Was this really going to be worthwhile or not? This is sort of the experiential information that Patricia was talking about, you know. Um, some people, you know, some lawyers who've worked in the system for a long time sort of have a feeling for it. Sometimes their feelings are right and sometimes they're not right. But what can we do about this? So this is actually a little movie here. This is using the Express tool and um, getting into the information. Uh, we're looking at employment litigation against the government. Okay, And what we have found, all right, so we're looking from 99 to 2003. And we see that um, outcome favors the U.S. So that's this top line up here. So it's gone from 28% in 1999 to 57% in 2003. So a big increase in cases that have favored the U.S. So if I'm suing the U.S., uh, not good. Um, chances of my winning have gone from 23% in 99 down to 2% in 2003. But then all down here, there are from 49 to 41%, uh, it says prevailing party unclear or not appropriate. These are generally cases that have been settled. Okay? So let's look. There are about 800 cases there, just 23 there, and about 600 here. So someplace over 1,400 cases overall. So, if I should win or settle, um, how often are monetary damages awarded? You know, is this going to be worth my while to even settle? Um, what's the average amount of damages and what's the median amount? Okay, so here we have another little thing. This is a, an example of our drill down capability. And this will actually produce multiple tables. And I haven't shown all of them in this little movie. Um, but it's asking for the relief granted, monetary relief granted, and it's going to ask for um, median and average. So for all of these tables, all of these statistics get recalculated for each table. So this is the end table that's produced, and it shows that in 2003, there were 239 cases, now this is out of the 1,400 or so, where monetary damages have been awarded. Uh, median amount is 30,000. Uh, average amount is uh, almost 112,000. Anybody have a clue as to which number would be relevant for me? Nobody wants to take a guess? There was one presentation this morning where the guy said, okay, take a guess. Just any guess and I'll give you a hat. But I don't have any hats to throw out. Um, Yeah. Um, the median amount means um, half get more and half get less. So if I'm advising my client, I've got to say, okay, you know, this is what you might get out of this. 
If I'm doing a whole bunch of cases, you're right. The average, there's been some big awards here that pull up that number. So if I'm doing a whole bunch of cases, then in fact, as a lawyer, this number might be relevant to me. You know, sometimes I'm going to win, sometimes I'm going to lose, but on average, I can expect to get this. For my client, however, that person is in the position of half get more, half get less. Do I want to go through all of this hassle? So this, but that's something that, that students need to be aware of. Why do these numbers differ? Uh, which one is appropriate to use? And you're right. You know, sometimes one's appropriate and sometimes another is appropriate. Okay, case number two. And this was a uh, case where we had an advocacy group who wanted to know how the current gun laws uh, were being enforced. And um, the, um, actually the uh, congressional committee, the staffer for the congressional committee said, oh, that's just crazy, you know, we're enforcing our gun laws, you know, they're just this, you know, right wing group that, you know, we don't even want to hear from them. So what are some numbers that could back this up? Um, now this is not um, a little movie, so this is just a still thing, but um, to answer this question, we might go to an uh, express tool and create some graphs. And first thing we see, if we were going to look at the number of referrals, um, and we see that in fact since uh, 98, they're up pretty sharply. So there are, the enforcement agencies are investigating this and they're referring those cases to the Justice Department. And we see that prosecutions are also up, okay? And we see that convictions are up. So what's the problem, right? Of course we're enforcing our gun laws. We need new ones. But if you look at declinations, these are the cases that justice chooses not to prosecute. In fact, declinations are also up. If you look at the percent of referrals that get prosecuted, we're actually prosecuting somewhat less than we have been. And if you look at prison terms resulting, they're shorter. So what's the answer here? Well, there isn't any magic answer, but it's a complex picture. And unless you ask all the relevant questions, you're not going to have any clue as to how complex that picture is. So, I don't, I don't know necessarily how you sort of engender um, intellectual curiosity, but we need to be teaching some sort of creative thinking skills to our students so that they even know to ask these questions. Okay, case number three, making large numbers work for you. And um, this case came from um, a law student at uh, an unnamed law school um, she was clerking for um, a, an appeals court judge, and uh, the appeals court judge wanted to know something about the district court judges uh, that they were getting appeals from. So, um, particularly interested in white collar crime. So, um, oh, this is a little movie. So, we're looking at uh, New York South in this case. Um, that's not um, that's not the district that this came from. But we're looking at um, white collar crime and restricting it to only white collar crime. And cases from, um, what did I choose? Um, 1986 to 2003. So we have a big, long cross section. Does anybody recognize any of the names of those judges? Uh, Cedarbaum? Yeah, well, there's Denny Chin. Actually, that's what I was going to wear. Yeah. Okay. Cedarbaum is actually uh, the judge for the Martha Stewart case. And so that's sort of a question that people have been asking. Ah, you know, what is, what is she doing? Well, um, we're looking at the number of prosecutions completed. Um, oh, God. Loud. Um, Okay, so 93, uh, Denny Chen has completed about the same number, um, 
88 out of those convicted for her, 108. So, you know, roughly the same number of convictions. Um, she has sentenced 29% to prison, very, very close to the total for that whole district. Um, Denny Chen has sentenced 55% to prison. Um, interesting. I guess the point here is that if you have a large number of cases, you can tell more than with a small number. So let's, let's see. Um, Oh, these, the, the ones with seven don't have anything. But sometimes you'll see uh, numbers that have been generated on the basis of, you know, just a handful of cases. And that really doesn't tell you nearly as much as numbers that have been generated on, you know, a large number of cases. You're going to get more of a cross-section, and all the variations will tend to um, sort of average out in that case. So I turn this back to... Patricia again, and, um, and if anybody's interested later in, you know, looking at the actual site, I did pull it up, and, you know, we can do some of that, but given the way technology sometimes doesn't work, I um, decided to go with little movies. We tried to give you some examples of cases where numbers might be useful in uh, a lawyer uh, thinking about how to advise a client in a particular case, though the actual examples that were based on real questions that track fielded involves congressional staffers or judges or whatnot. But you can, you can imagine that this kind of information would be very useful to somebody trying to analyze whether to go forward in a case, with a case or how to proceed. And we hadn't, we really haven't given you any examples of getting down to particular judges. We could look at the individual cases that the judges did to see how close they might be to the one that we have at hand or how different they were. Um, I wanted to take just a minute to show that this information could be used in substantive ways as well as in sort of environmental contextual analyzing whether or not to process a case. And I, I brought up a, a series of cases which I think collectively we'll all recognize at least one or more of them. Um, in McCluskey versus Kemp, David Baldus from the University of Syracuse during part of this time and the University of Iowa the rest of the time did this absolutely complex study of death penalty cases in which he came to the conclusion that, um, that you were more likely to get prosecuted uh, uh, for the death penalty if you were a black person, a black defendant who had killed a white victim. And they try, and McCleskey tried to use this information to establish that he, he was an inappropriate candidate for the death penalty because the death penalty was discriminatorily applied. It, it didn't work, but the court gave a lot of attention to the statistics and, and David Baldus's study and showed how it might be used in analyzing a substantive issue. Uh, the Castaneda case is the case of the uh, racial disparity in the selection of grand jurors. Uh, Gomillion versus Lightfoot is a, a um, redistricting case where race was used to create a very odd 27-sided uh, district. And, of course, the Yikwo case is the case in which statistics uh, and numbers were used very powerfully in the uh, Chinese laundry permit cases. That's a 19, or an 1886 case. So there's a range of cases and a range of issues in which a statistical information about how the, the government works, the law works, have played an important role or potentially could play an important role in the substantive issues as well as in the uh, contextual issues about whether a case might work or not. And as this kind of information that Linda and Bob have been talking about becomes more and more available, and I think it will become more available exponentially rather than sort of just uh, uh, linearly, then students are going to have more and more opportunity to see how this information could be used in their substantive analysis and in their practical skills 
you know, and things like trial practice and uh, negotiation and other kinds of uh, lawyering skills. And they need to, our, our position is simply just waving a little bit of a red flag here that uh, the time has come for, um, uh, for recognizing that there's an information revolution afoot, as, as, a, as our little slide says that it's going to, that it already has uh, over a long time period impacted on legal education, but often not as much as it might because the lawyers needed statisticians and expensive uh, information gathering methods in order to get the information that they might need in order to make their arguments, but that's changing. That's the point of our demonstration today is that more and more information is going to be available both privately and publicly, that lawyers need to be prepared to recognize where this type of information might fit into their lawyering skills. And consequently, law schools need to start thinking about uh, how and where and how, how much of these kinds of skills should be recognized in the legal curriculum and uh, whether they're needed for uh, students to uh, to be accomplished students when they graduate, because we wouldn't expect to graduate students who couldn't do uh, uh, st statutory research or case research. Very quickly, we think there will come a time when it it won't be appropriate to graduate students who haven't, uh, who aren't able to exercise a certain amount of uh, number related research. Um, so. We're just raising that flag and we're saying now, if not several weeks ago or several years ago, is the time to start planning for the, when this day comes. And uh, with that, I'll stop and say, if, does anybody have any questions and, that we can field? Yes. Where do you believe this belongs in the curriculum and who should be teaching it and do you do it at Syracuse? Uh, okay. Uh, let me start what with what we do at Syracuse. Okay. okay? We do practically nothing in legal research and writing at the moment, although we've just added uh, to our first year course a second year course, and there, there may be a useful place for a, a component, a uh, two, three week component there. Is that a That's a mandatory course. Um, we do offer and over different times, we certainly offer accounting for lawyers, which is a slightly different kind of uh, numerical literacy. We have offered statistics for lawyers, though we're not at the moment. We don't at the moment have somebody who teaches that. We have lots of students in joint degree programs who get some kind of numeracy, uh, num numerical literacy in um, methods courses that they take as part of their joint degrees. and. As Syracuse follows the SPIRE process that, um, uh, that Bob mentioned, this, this top-down uh, um, mandate to have more interaction among departments and more uh, joint uh, degrees being offered by the department, you know, a single degree being offered by two departments as opposed to what the students now do, which is getting two degrees offered offered by separate departments. We'd have one degree offered by two departments. Well, as that goes on, we expect that there will be more of that. But we're, we're at the infancy of this thinking ourselves. And so we, we envision there being a, a number of models under which it could be taught. But, but uh, to the dismay of the legal writing and research faculty, uh, unfortunately, they were the first people looked at as a possible source for this, and uh, we're, that's going to have to be worked out. But it's a good question. Yes? What is the nature of the license for the, the, the paper law, the law school were to subscribe? Would they be able to make it available to all of their patrons? And yeah, yes. Basically, um, it's IP address recognition, and so it's available generally in uh, all of the faculty offices, um, usually in the clusters. 
uh, if law schools have a proxy server where you know faculty can come in from the outside and that proxy server address you know is recognized by our server um, the only thing that um, we have one law school um, that uh, couldn't segregate their law school from the whole campus and so that we charged a higher price for uh, just because it was just sort of overwhelming but generally, it's within uh, within the law school, and um, you know, if they, for law schools that don't have a proxy server, although I think that that's pretty common now, but we do have one that um, people get into the account with a user ID and password from home. You know, so the question is about the cost. Bob, Bob had said you should bring some materials, and I said, oh, well, no, that's not what this is. I brought some materials. Good for you. So, <laughs> I don't have many of them, but um. Do you require uh, Excel capabilities part of your year? Oh. Um, we're we're moving to the point where all the students have to have computers. I don't think we have it yet, but we're we're. I think the either the incoming class is going to require it and I think we do a lot of things to try and make sure they have word kind or word um, capabilities I don't think we have anything in right now where Excel is mandatory to them but certainly having those skills would be marry with with this quite well and I think that that's probably it's probably the kind of thing that needs to be addressed in the planning sessions that that where there's a, going to be a uh, sort of a push-pull kind of thing. What kinds of cases, what kinds of information is there? What kinds of skills are needed to use it? What kinds of ca information do we think is coming? What kinds of skills will be needed for that? Certainly the students in accounting for lawyers, I think, use Excel, but I'm not sure that, uh, in fact, I'm fairly sure that we don't have any systematic teaching of students or testing of students to make sure they can use Excel. Actually, there's a. The, sorry. Um, not really. We don't have you know any button, and you know this is one of the things that we're uh, really trying to come to grips with. Uh, as I said we're primarily grant funded, so we have a lot of foundations that have paid for you know uh, putting together all of this data, and um, so we have one foundation in particular that's. Is interested in having us get, you know, market this. Well, we're academics, we're not marketers. Um, although I have become that yeah, a little bit. Um, so they want us to get people to subscribe, but don't give the data away. So I, you know, I don't know what we're going to do because we're we are getting more uh, requests for Excel files. I mean, for the most part, our tools can do what's needed. Uh, but there, but there are cases. Um, uh, there's actually one law professor who was um, wanting to merge some other data into ours. Um, and that would be a case that you know you would need to download it. So I don't know where that's going. You know, that's sort of between us and our, our funders. And you know, I suppose if subscriptions paid more of our way, then we have a little bit more control. Did I answer your question? <laughs> And, and much as I love track and am, you know, a big fan of tracks, I think we need to look, too, at, at the bigger picture because, um, I mean, take, for example, the uh, State of New York Attorney General's website, which didn't exist 15 years ago. Now it exists. If you want to look and see what the Attorney General is doing, I mean, everybody knows that Elliot Spitzer has been out there kicking butt for, you know, years now, every place he gets a chance. You want to go and see what he's been doing and have the cases against the stock, mar stock brokers collected or stuff. He doesn't. He has a linear listing of e sort of in, in the way of um, press releases, okay? And it's awkwardly searchable. That's, Ten years from now, the Attorney General's website is going to be much more accessible. It's going to, be, it's going to have these kinds of tools where like cases are are collected and 
students and lawyers and others are going to be able to see much more transparently what he is doing. And he's not alone at the moment. You look in the insurance department website in the state of New York, you can't, I mean, they have these little reports they send out every year bragging, boom, 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 boom. We, we did this braggadocia, we did that braggadocia, but there's no way you can look on their website to see the data behind the brags. But in 10 years, I don't think just, I don't think that will be the same. I think this information will be more accessible and it will be available in downloadable form as the de public demands more of it. Yes? One last question. Back in 1980, I visited the SEC and they have all kinds of statistics in front of the markets. Do you have any of that data where you're... Uh, We're not. Uh, what we have essentially chosen to do is if the data is available elsewhere, generally don't handle it. We're, you know, just more than happy to have uh, them do it. What we really go after um, are um, systems of records that uh, should be in the public domain, but are not now accessible. So, you know, we, you know, we're certainly not a be-all and end-all website. We are an academic research unit. Uh, we sort of consider ourselves a prototype of things to come. Now, Patricia is much more um, hopeful about where things will get to. Um, <laughs> I guess my own experience is that a lot of this stuff is used uh, for government oversight, and nobody wants somebody looking over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what it amounts to. So I think that that is going to limit what's available. I think that we've really got to rely on the courts to say, this needs to be transparent. And if the courts don't say that, um, and one of the things that I learned was that FOIA doesn't apply to the courts. Isn't that interesting? And as a matter of fact, um, one of our lawsuits uh, deals with whether or not uh, docket numbers needs to be supplied to us. Well, that's now being routinely deleted from all of our data. Because in fact, if we had docket number, then we can wrap, you know, Department of Justice numbers together with court numbers. And so that lawsuit has been pending for seven years. And nobody's ruling on it. The interesting thing is that this data is publicly available. If you want to walk your little feet down to the courthouse clerk's office and start opening files, you can have access to all this data. But what they're what the government is doing is saying, okay, but we're going to make you jump through those hoops. And we're not going to make it accessible so that it's more widely available. What, what if I want data about California and live in New York? You know, or why, why shouldn't it be available? I mean, I think those questions are going to be asked more and more. I think some, some public agencies are ahead of others in, in putting information out. I think as more experience happens with it being available without the world crumbling, you know, to a halt, people will be more uh, willing to put it out there. And so I think we should be planning for the day when we're going to be overloaded with information and information that would be useful to a lawyer who is thinking about uh, a case in a practicing law in case or a lawyer who's working for some governmental agency thinking about policy issues or lawyers and judges, you know, I think that, that the, how the law operates is, is the kind of information that we've just worked with intuitively. I mean, just the whole basic, is, it rash, is A, ra the means rationally related to the end? You know, we don't you know, count noses on those cases. We, the judges sit there and look at the ceiling and say, oh, that seems intuitively reasonable to me that there's a relationship. Let it go. Well, more and more cases there are going to be, and there are plenty of cases where if you actually study the numbers, there is no relationship <laughs> between the means and the ends. And the question that raises, sh should those public policies continue when there is no relationship? I mean, I can ens envision this, you know, being... Uh, applicable in a wide range of lawyering contexts, as well, of course, public citizens. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Assuming that 
that we have the most up to date. Yeah, and um, what we try to do is um, uh, SAS has a variety of capabilities built into it. So, in fact, it's possible to put footnotes on tables. So, for example, one of the things that um, Justice started withholding uh, fairly recently is um, program category and lead charge on brand new referrals. So until a referral gets acted on, um, they don't tell us much. Just a referral came in from um, you know, <coughs> alcohol, 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 tobacco, firearms, and explosives. That's the new name. So we know that there is some, something going on. Um, but no, not any program category or anything like that. So we'll put a footnote on the table um, that's generated automatically saying, you know, uh, we have filed suit or whatever. So, so there, there's some sort of notice. Um, and, you know, with the IRS, I don't know what's going to happen there. I mean, it's like, it's just so blatant that we're all just, you know, our jaws are still dropping, but they can't do this. Well, they've done it. So. Okay, well, thank you very much.